Hello, good evening, anybody that's joining us, and welcome to uh, this evening's edition of, or episode of ELT Time MENA, which is our advancing learning podcast series for English language teachers in the MENA region. And as I'm setting everything up, we'd like to welcome you this evening. If you're joining us and you have a cup of tea with you, please do let us know what you're drinking. I'll check the chat boxes to see who is with us. I can see one person there, which is good. It means we are live. So this evening we are joined by, uh, we're very welcome to join, uh, a Spring of Nature author. So I would like to welcome Dr. Aftab Ara. Good evening, Vera. How are you this evening? You with us? Yeah, good evening, Nathan. Great, it's great to join the ELT time, season two, episode eight, in the innovation shift. And yep. thanks for your invitation. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to having a conversation about what you just mentioned, your, your publication. So before we do that, uh, let me introduce you first. So you are an educator, uh, a researcher, and an academic. Um, and as you just mentioned, you have recently co-published a book called The Innovation Shift in Higher Education that was published in 2021. Uh, I know you've got a background in uh, a variety of things, actually. You've got a background in engineering. You've got a PhD in management. Uh, you've been a lecturer as well. Um, you're originally from India, right? And yeah, now, yeah. Now you live in Saudi Arabia. You live in yes. Ohio, which is in the north for those people who know Saudi Arabia. And you've been doing lots of different things. You've been working in uh, global sustainability networks. You've been doing things around artificial intelligence um, and educational development as well. So a variety of different uh, experiences and backgrounds, which I'm sure you'll do a better job of, of explaining to us and describing to us as we go through this podcast. So I wanna start with, with you. Uh, a little bit about you know how you got into education, how you got into academia, a little bit about your background, your passions, your interests. If we could start there, would that be okay? Yeah, sure, of course. Thanks for the introduction. Um, it's uh, great to join uh, this session. And uh, as you have mentioned everything, so I don't think uh, I have lot <laughs> anything else to mention. Yes, I have been a part of uh, several research groups. The Global uh, Sustainability Future Progress Through Partnership Network, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a network where uh, we are trying to bring the world and make the world a better place to live and bring an impact to the society to learn and grow. There's Then I'm also involved, yes, in uh, one of the Global South project uh, where we are doing a project, myself and our team, we are uh, involved in doing a project to improve the global health and endanger the health outcomes uh, with mm. the help of artificial intelligence. Then yeah. uh, I've also worked, yeah. Uh, so I've also worked in several colleges and universities in Saudi Arabia. I've also worked in uh, India brief before I came here. And uh, I like to research, write about new trends in technology and business in my posts, which I do on LinkedIn. Nice. So we do a lot of stuff around um, some of the sustainability stuff here in, in Macmillan um, and Spring of Nature as well, which I'm sure you know. Um, what, kinds of, yeah, like, yeah. what kinds of activities do you, you guys kind of do? Because um, it sounds like we've got similar kinds of things going on. We do lots of things around advocacy for, for sustainability, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we do a lot of things because we do education with schools around things like global citizenship education. I am quite interested actually, because you've got, you're working in a different area of sustainability. What kinds of activities um, does that group get up to? Here, the activities uh, are like uh, doing a research studies or doing podcast, having webinars. So every Friday there is a webinar, like in every month we do have webinars uh, with uh, the GSFN group. And 
it this supports this sustainability this group supports education research development also it's linked with energy sustainable practices and cooperation and collaboration with other schools universities etc okay nice good um do you you share those things on your linkedin can people find them there and, and get involved uh, yes, the main founder is Dr. Renuka Thakore, and she invited. Uh, so um, since then, like since last year, we have been involved in these um, projects. Nice. Okay, great. So thanks for sharing a little bit about uh, a little bit more about yourself. Uh, we're going to move on because, as I mentioned, you're um, an author with Springer Nature, and Macmillan Education is a part of the Springer Nature group. Um, which is why I really wanted to kind of reach out to you um, and and bring you in to what we're doing and, and get your insights, because I think it's really interesting to find out more uh, the perspectives of people who are working, A, within Spring and Nature, but the authors and academics that feed into a lot of the work that I do, which is more with schools on the grounds, uh, how to translate that academia, I guess, into practice. So I thought... When I saw, you know, your your book um, and I saw you on LinkedIn, I was like, this is such a great person. I really want to talk to them. So thanks so much for, you know, taking the time to come and join us. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, about your book. So it's called The Innovation Shift in Higher Education. And I think before we talk about the book itself um, and some of the things that uh, you, I guess, have discovered and become interested in, in terms of the book itself. I guess I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, your motivations for the topic, because it's an interesting title. The innovation shift could mean lots of different things to lots of different people. So what were your motivations for A, researching this particular topic that you did and for getting involved in, in co-authoring this book? Yeah. Um... Actually, this study was done uh, in one of this from one of the state, Orissa. So from the universities of Orissa, the study which was done, um, uh, we took the data from those uh, universities, from the faculties, from the staff, uh, administrators. And my motivation for researching on this topic is um, uh, my passion for educational transformation from prayer to then old to new. And here we find that um, India is vast, as you know, and uh, there are there is a high level of vulnerability due to globalization, entry of foreign universities, etc. So there are new laws like NAC, uh, which is emerging, and it is transforming the way study uh, the university studies are going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are measures which are being taken to improve the quality of higher education and governing bodies. They have strict regulations on the quality aspect of the education, but uh, there is a need to uh, for innovation on the academic process and to strengthen the enablers of the innovation by uh, identifying those aspects where yeah. we have to focus. So okay. innovation and change are needed to save the Indian universities for which this study was done. And uh, I have also found great satisfaction in exploring both the theoretical aspect while doing the book, as well as the practical implications of these aspects. And writing a book about it has been a great way to document my findings and share my insights with the wider audience for yeah. their knowledge. Yeah, and I believe that this topic is very important as we enter the new era of digital transformation. And mm -hmm. We need to consider how these changes is affecting our society and uh, work, and it will help the future generation, future students. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And um, I guess a key question then is, I guess, how much work was it? Because I think a lot of people would love to write a book but how much time and energy does it take? How, um, you know, what, I don't want to use the word sacrifice, but I know a lot of people that have written books in the past, you know, it, it really take, consumes their thoughts. It consumes, you know, their home life. 
uh, your experience was how did you find it? Uh, actually, the if you are you want to write a book, then there should be a motivation. It should excite you. That is the first thing. If it it should excite you, then every morning it will not be a difficult thing for you to start, right? Like doing one page at a time. So it is your inner motivation, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you find like, um, did you find a, a, a challenge? I know a lot of other people because I'm I know a few writers, and I know that they hit this kind of this part in the process where it becomes a challenge. You're like, it's hard to stay motivated. I've kind of got halfway through, and I'm not sure how to finish this part. I'm not sure how, where to go with this next bit. And was it was that a did you find that or did was it okay for you? You kind of you had your process and you planned it and it was okay. Actually, this was a, as it, it was a part of my PhD thesis. It was so which was converted to a book. And so a part of it, the study was all it was done, but still converting it to a book is again another process because you go through the proposal, which will be accepted. So Springer Nature ex accepted the proposal and then they set a deadline. So when they set the deadline, then it became easier for me. Like yeah, to, the yeah, to focus. focus and move through, and then it was fine. It was great, actually. Uh, okay, and I, and perhaps another follow up question, if you don't mind, is um, I guess how was your experience of, of publishing with Springer Nature? Um, and I haven't published with Springer Nature, but uh, as a publisher, uh, were they easy to get in touch with? Were they helpful? Did they guide you through the process? Uh, yes, uh, once they accepted, the, uh, there was a review. So uh, then accordingly, my book was, uh, I shared my uh, materials with them. And, uh, the experience was great because they were very much, uh, communication was very good. Uh, the one who communicated with me, uh, very good. And uh, when I shared the documents, it was well received. And wherever there was change to be done, they shared the contents. I did it. And so it was a smooth process, not a hassle at all. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on um, and talk a little bit about the book itself. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time. So we, it, it is a big book. So I've been right through it and kind of looked at the different things uh, that, that go on, the different chapters. I was really interested in the book, A, because... I get, like I mentioned, when you have this title, The Innovation Shift, and you think about higher education, for me as an educator and as someone who works with lots of teachers, innovation is often translated to classroom practice. It's how do we become more innovative with the things we're doing with students for them to be able to do better in their studies or learning English or whatever it is. So that's how most people in education tend to see innovation. But actually, I was really interested when I looked through the book to see that you tackle this idea of innovation from quite a few different angles than that. So why don't you very quickly give us uh, a summary of the kind of main elements of the book and perhaps um, some of the kind of key uh, recommendations or some of the takeaways, some of the things that you learned um, from doing that research? Uh, yeah, of course, yes. So my book, Innovation Shift in Higher Education, it helps in adding value to higher education institutions um, by providing strategic uh, managers with the necessary steps for achieving sustainable success through innovation. It also provides insights on how to foster innovativeness within the educational institutes and, uh, it, and gives them a competitive edge by uh, helping them become more efficient in their operations. Um, and if um, I would like to tell more, like what elements are included in this book, then the constructs which have been used here are the HR practices, the knowledge management process, and the innovation. So if I go deeper into the uh, finer elements of what are the uh, elements I have taken, like in HR practices, uh, they have several dimensions like recruitment, compensation and rewards, performance appraisal, teamwork, training and development, they all have um, 
significant role to play with the efficiency of the knowledge management process. Mm -hmm. And again, these knowledge management processes are uh, the knowledge diagnosis, knowledge acquisition, knowledge generation, sharing, storing of knowledge, and also the application of knowledge. And in the innovation, the dimensions which uh, I have taken into consideration are product innovation, process innovation, and organizational innovation. So yeah. as I found that there was a gap in these, I went on um, to do a further study in this group. group and uh, the suggestions which are which uh, we could find uh, from these study and analysis was for innovation effectiveness in the higher education institutes, the individual dimensions of human resource practices and knowledge management process, they have to be efficient. Right. Uh, like educational institutions must have a very well-developed recruitment practice and systems. Then the uh, pay scales and reward systems required for the effective uh, knowledge management uh, processes should be there for the faculty then um, there should be proper performance appraisal which should be full-fledged manner for an effective knowledge management process and the faculty should be well trained there should be good teamwork and there should be a very um, good quality culture to produce leaders in uh, um, the educational institutes to compete as required for the training development yeah. It's, so yes. interesting. it's such an interesting topic to me. So you're seeing um, as education as something beyond teachers and students. You're seeing it as a as an ecosystem, right? That yes. in effect, because there are teams of people and there are different personalities, there are different people coming with previous experiences, there are people who have trained in different things. Some people have trained in finance, some people are trained as teachers, some people are HR, some people are management. You've got this kind of collective of different people who form this ecosystem and they create knowledge in themselves as a, as a team, right? That's what, that's what, you, that's the, the crux of, that's the baseline, right? Is that, I'm understanding that correct, yeah? Yeah, here actually three aspects like the human resource, how we can inculcate human resource, knowledge management pro uh, processes for the innovation of uh, the uh, institutes. Yeah. Yeah. And we also created a model uh, which can be used effectively in educational institutes. So okay. that was also a part. Mm, okay. So you've got this, what I just, what I just mentioned, you've got this, this ecosystem of people that's that create knowledge, that contain knowledge. And then, so you're looking at management practices around how to yeah. manage and how mm -hmm. to drive them forward through innovative practices. So you, yes. you just mentioned you've got this model. Why don't you, can you explain a little bit about what, what's, what does this model look like? Uh, the model is, uh, which we created the model was uh, with the, uh, for the innovation practices. So here, the focus of the research was to study the mediating effect of knowledge management, which was between human resource practices and innovation. So the whole model is geared like knowledge management uh, process. And this knowledge management innovation mo model, which we created, is uh, intended to improve the quality of higher education and to encourage creativity by mm -hmm. these human resource practices and knowledge management process. And we have taken into consideration all the elements of HR, like uh, recruitment, compensation rewards, uh, then uh, training development, teamwork, performance, uh, appraisal. And also we have taken elements of innovation, um, innovation and as well as knowledge management. So all these elements together we have taken and we have to inculcate that into the objectives of the um, universities so that they make it a mission, and they have a broader vision to create uh, these innovative model in the university so that uh, the university is as a whole, it will be um, going forward in to tackle these obstacles like um, uh, whatever obstacles which uh, like foreign in uh, 
invasion, uh, the uh, other universities which are doing from like for, from the foreign, uh, most of the um, like, uh, universities and they can compete with them, they can standardize themselves in that standard. Mm, okay, yeah, that's an interesting. But um, so the last follow-up question I have around the kind of book um, and, and the content of the book, I guess is around um, thinking about now the book is published and people reading it, what are the, because we mentioned recommendations. So I guess this is perhaps an addition to that. But what would be some of the challenges that, uh, I guess, higher education institutions, maybe thinking about them here in the MENA context, would face in implementing some of those recommendations? Are there any, are there any challenges? Uh, this, was, uh, this study was actually done for uh, it was done in the uh, Odisha, India. like part yeah. of India. But yeah. here, if I say there are challenges here, like, uh, there needs to be research and development, right? Mm -hmm. This is one place where we need to grow. Yeah. Though it's growing, but there has to be more improvement, like in the research and development part, I can see. That is one aspect I think where we can explore more uh, so that we can be at par with the European countries. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, and, and, that, and I think across this region, um, and it's different from country to country, definitely. But there yeah, has been a lot of progress um, and starting to see local academics work become more prominent is a really good thing. So, you know, I'm seeing uh, professors in Saudi Arabia, um, you know, you see their papers, see their books being published by people like Springer Nature. That, that's a really good move. You're not just getting a singular version of the world. Yeah. Well, Authors from Europe yeah, yeah. or America, exactly. always setting the tone. And, and I was thinking about it. I, I put another post out yesterday and I was trying to think of the right words to use. You know, and I was thinking, you know, I went in education, I'm always hearing things like, you know, people quote, you know, Bloom's taxonomy and they quote Chomsky and they, they quote this and they quote that, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, what's the ambitions of the people here? Are, are, do they want to be quoted themselves, not just quoting other people? I want to create that that research and that academia and for people to be going to conferences and, and using my name and, um, and you know, the work that I, that I put out into the world. So that shift is there, I think, but I, I agree that um, there probably needs to be some more support for that. I guess more funding, um, more managerial support. I guess it, it leads into what you've just been discussing, knowledge management and innovation, universities having the capacity to, to help academics, professors, lecturers, to be able to, to communicate their work. So that's a good thing, I think. Yeah, and this is this field is ever growing, right, you know? So from, yeah. from like last 10 years to now, it is growing. So there has been a tremendous change. Yeah. Good, yeah, good. I'm glad that you feel that, good. Okay, I'm going to move the discussion on a little bit because we've got another kind of half of the, of the podcast that we want to talk about. Because when we had an original discussion, I said that this book and this topic kind of, it fits with a lot of the kind of contemporary discussions that I see around transformation of education. We obviously had, we had COVID. Now people say we're in a kind of post-COVID world. During COVID, there was a lot of adaptation there was a lot of innovation to be able to manage what we were trying to achieve things like zoom popped up things like um, you know people using more online and digital resources all of these types of things so the transformation is in some ways it was already playing out in some ways it's been forced upon us and people now i, I saw a post yesterday that said you know now we're not uh hang on, we're not changing to adapt. We want to create change now. Yeah, we're in this post-COVID period. We want to create change, not just be adapting because of the circumstances, which I thought was quite interesting. But I wanted to get your kind of, your take on the field of, it could be education or it could be academia. But I guess what is, in your opinion, required for education to keep moving in the right direction? That's a difficult question. Hope you don't mind. Yeah. Well, this is a really very important question as now, because there is a great transformation going on, surely, 
in the way we work now. Everywhere we work, like in whatever sector, there is transformation due to COVID. It has happened. Everyone has to agree on this, right? And this has impacted even education as well. Uh, this transformation of education after COVID world is one that will require great thought, really, of course. And we have seen unprecedented shifts to online learning, which has um, served as an example of how quickly education can move uh, towards adaptation, right, whenever we need. And uh, further, there is uh, also continued investment in the technology and infrastructure for remote learning everywhere. And particularly for those who are not able to access quality teaching facilities. So this is a very good opportunity, right? Yeah. Uh, like we have so many online courses like Coursera and uh, Khans Academy, Demi, et cetera, and so many new courses where those who are not able to do the courses on learn, they have good facilities now. And in addition, there needs to be greater focus now on student-centered learning approach that rise above the traditional methods. And this means that um, there has to be a reformulation of the existing curriculum, its objectives, and implementing more modern pedagogies that allow students to explore knowledge by asking questions, taking part in collaborative activities. And also educators should make greater use of uh, educational technology to facilitate more dynamic and engaging learning experience uh, it's also important that we continue to reevaluate and assess, uh, know the methods of assessment used in education. And we also uh, need to find out better measures where we can measure the student's progress and achievement so that uh, each individual reaches their final potential. Ultimately, uh, I can say that the transformation of education will require a fundamental change in how we think about learning. It is not um, enough now to simply transmit information from teacher to student, like the lecture method which we used to do. We must now create an environment where students have to thrive and explore on their own. And so by making these changes, we can ensure that education remains relevant and responsive to the needs of the ever-changing, I would like to say ever-changing world of generative AI now, mm -hmm. as we are seeing, right? Yeah. Yes, you know, when you've touched, I mean, you, you, it's such a wonderful summary. I don't really need to say very much, I don't think. Uh, you've touched on quite a few different points. Um, the advancement of, of technology and digital tools. I, I like the way that you see that as, as a way to invent, advance things like inclusion, making it uh, more accessible for students who wouldn't have had access to that in the first place or would have struggled. Yeah. And that can be accessing education itself, or it could be accessing certain parts within a curriculum. Um, as you said, making it more student centered, um, that helps with that as well. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a lovely summary. I, I think perhaps my follow up question to this, um, to, to what you've just said is perhaps around students. We're seeing this transformation. How do you think students are, um, A, adapting to that transformation? Do they see it as a good thing? Are they part of that process? Um, and, you know, is there, I don't know, is there any challenge to, to getting students to move with us? We're trying to move them forward and make it better for them. But, you know, I, I'm thinking kind of a little bit outside of the box, but based on conversations with lots of teachers, there's still this mentality of students to be spoon fed like, like they used to. So, Changing that mindset is also part of that process, I think. I don't know. I think it depends uh, on the level of students. Yeah. Good. The level of the students, it depends on the motivation, on the country to country also, I think it will vary. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that's that. There. But I think uh, the students are, uh, you know, the younger kids are also, they are so much engaged in mobile and they, they know, they know where to go. Right, you don't have to be after them. I think um, maybe some need to be spoon fed, but I don't think all, but most of them have come up with the technology. Yeah, and now uh, it is a good tool for us like to look into the way where we can improve, like we can assess them, their assessments and the method in which they will learn 
So this is a right time. And I think we have the right tools now. Mm, yeah, I, I agree that I think that's, um, that student, I don't want to use the word problem, but students aren't the problem in that transformation. I, th I think a key element that you mentioned was around assessment. So I think the students that are expecting to be spoon fed are still expecting, I think the system in terms of assessment perhaps has got a little bit of work to do because I think it's the assessment that makes them feel like I just need this to pass this. So you need to need to give me that. I think there's a separation between the classroom learning and that, um, that engagement, you know, students want, they want to do things, they want to do things that are fun. They want to do things that are creative. They like working together. But I think the assessment part is the bit that makes them feel like. Yeah, I think uh, here, if we make the, like, whatever we are teaching, project-based teaching, I think I'm for those project-based teaching. Like that will make them learn and have fun and learn both. Like they will learn and they will not know that they are learning in the process. So that's one way where we can um, channel their attention. So that's yeah. one way, yeah. yeah no, and I there agree. are different uh, levels of students, like there is again differentiation, right? <laughs> lots of things in teaching. Yeah, lots. Yeah, no, and I agree. And I, I like all that project-based learning material. Um, and, and digital really can help us to, um, you know, make that more fruitful for students. Um, because, you know, all of that, I think as, as technology continues to develop and we get more things like AI and VR and students are going to yes. be, they're going to be able to create really cool projects that are going to give them a lot of reasons to learn. They're going to feel quite connected to, to, yeah, to, to exactly. yeah I, I do think that's a good thing. Okay, I'm gonna, one last question, because uh, I'm aware of the time. So moving on from this idea of, okay, I, education is transforming. We've just had a really nice discussion around how and some of the challenges. You mentioned a few things earlier in the podcast that were re more related to your book. And it was around, I guess, the skills that people need. We've mentioned that education is changing and students are gonna need different things in the future, not just information to pass exams they're going to need skills to go into the workforce different types of jobs uh, a lot of them probably connected to technology so um, I guess the question is you know in terms of transformation of education what kinds of skills do you think that we should be working on with students that would really help them and I guess you're looking at this from a different angle than we are as teachers you're looking at it from this academia and uh, innovation and this ecosystem that we mentioned yeah skills I'd like to think about kind of skills for the future I guess mm -hmm. so according to Dell you know 80 percent of us don't know who or what kind of work we'll be doing and that the works or what work uh, it does not exist yet mm. and so here my tips for the graduates who will be passing in the next decade and what they can showcase in their CVs when they're applying to future jobs. And they have a lot to do, right? When it comes to preparing the young people for the future, there are things like I would like to add up. They should be um, digitally literate, which is very important in this 21st century. They should develop critical skills uh, so that they can analyze information and make informed decisions about their own lives also. Yep. Additionally, problem solving, collaboration are also important skills for navigating the challenge of the modern world now. And it's also important that these young people learn how to effectively communicate with others by using online as well as offline modes. And this helps in building relationships and form their own opinions on different subjects. Creativity is also another aspect, I think, where the students should think, like you said, outside the box, right? And they have to come up with some innovative solutions to complex problems which the society is facing. And uh, it will be uh, it will be challenging, like you know, later on, 
for machines to learn how to take into account another person's emotions and feelings, which the machines can never do. So it's essential that the that we, even it applies to us, like to develop emotional intelligence, empathy, or a capacity to put oneself in other shoes and see things from their perspective. Yeah. And finally, I would like to say that we have seen machines which are quite efficient in doing a very routine tasks, but they don't know how to inspire people. Mm -hmm. So they need to develop the leadership skills so that they can guide the others, they can grow, they can develop, and they can thrive in this world. Oh, I like that last one around in inspiring. I've never really thought about it. Um, that the others, I, I see a lot of those other things in um, innovative educational models, I guess if we want to use that particular type of language. So if I look at um, the kinds of English courses that, that we publish now, you know, you see a lot of those types of things, critical thinking tasks uh, and developing yeah. over time. That's definitely in course books now. We see social and emotional learning really embedded into learning now. So getting students to be able to identify their own emotions, control them, be able to empathize yeah. with others, as you mentioned. Um, but I really like this last one that's, yeah, I mean, we do see um, technology. I mean, we think of robots, but we think of technology more generally and the abilities of that technology and the way that it's advancing. And some of the things that we see now are almost unbelievable. We're almost moving into the kind of realms of, of science fiction, but you're right. Like they cannot, they struggle to empathize with others um, and inspire leadership to be able to kind of problem solve for kind of everyday problems. They can do things, but they can't figure out how, what they do, because this is sustainability, right? It's figuring out how what you do has an impact beyond your immediate environment, what you cannot see. That, that for me is kind of, the, I guess, the crux of sustainability. Exactly. So yeah, how, how do you create technology that can do that? I'm not sure that you can, or maybe you can, maybe they will, who knows? Interesting though, yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to add based on what I just said? Um, maybe they should, uh, there should be uh, good listening skills. <laughs> That's important. Yeah. 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 Not added. yeah. You mentioned communication and yeah. 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 Being able to communicate, I think, beyond the functional level, um, mm -hmm. not just communicating for the sake of communicating, but being able to actually engage with topics. And I guess this, I guess, brings us full circle in terms of what you were saying about project based learning and task based learning is being able to actually sit with others and communicate about something and not just do everything yourself or expect other people just to do things for you to be able to interact with others yeah hmm. yeah and they should also learn how to do this augmented learning and working you know working they should learn this also mm -hmm. yeah. even we have to yeah, we do. Yeah. You were saying people don't know what they're going to be doing in the future. I know what I'll be doing. I'll be retired, probably. <laughs> and, I'll be letting, and I'll let the future generation uh, take care of all of those things. And me, hopefully. <laughs> no, I'm not that old. But I guess, you know, even I need to think about these things all the time. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such an interesting discussion. I'm sure we could continue with this discussion um, and a lot of these topics because there were so many kind of quite broad topics that we could really kind of gone off on a tangent and talked about them and how we feel like they play out um you know where we are here in Riyadh how they play out how that's different to where you're from in India and where you've done your research we could have talked about all these things but we are running out of time so I do want to thank you for coming on and, and talking to us this afternoon uh we do always conclude uh with uh, our favorite tip for teachers I know you've been a lecturer as well so I'm sure you do have tips for teachers and you've been doing research and you've got a book so I'm sure you've got loads of things um, advice that you would give to teachers but let's just use one uh, what would be your favorite tip for for teachers who are listening uh, I think uh, like now to embrace the technology that would be my one and foremost tip and uh, utilize these emerging technologies like the artificial intelligence, virtual re reality, and augmented reality to engage the students 
to create dynamic learning environment and explore more innovative approaches like flipped classrooms, experiential learning, uh, harnessing the power of data by harnessing them, creating a very great collaborative culture. That is also another thing I would like to add the extra one. No, there should be a collaboration between educators, teachers, students, parents by online discussions, chat boxes, forums, etc. So that will help all of us so that to ensure success in future. Yeah, that's it's a really good tip. And I, I guess, yeah, don't don't be afraid of it, right? Embrace it and and use it for your own purposes. Uh, don't feel like you have to just follow it because everybody else is doing it. Find what works for you, perhaps. Nice. Yeah, I like that. And uh, you mentioned one thing there, actually, that we that we didn't talk about, but I did think about earlier in the conversation when I was talking about the school being an ecosystem, was thinking about the impact of parents, because parents are kind of outside of the ecosystem, but they're actually still part of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that important aspect. So then there needs to be a collaboration. Uh, there really needs to be a collaborative culture, in fact, mm. between all. Yeah. And that's such a challenge with so many different perspectives. Perhaps, perhaps a, a conversation for for a future podcast. There, the challenges of of collaborating, communicating. Okay, we're talking about these future skills for students, but actually, they're future yeah. skills for all of us. Well, I'm sure we can yeah, all. Yeah, it's for the students as well as for us. <laughs> yeah, like that is, they're never involved, and they're mostly wrong. <laughs> Yeah, it's a difficult one. Perhaps we'll we'll try and find the we'll bring a speaker in to find to talk about involving parents. I'm sure there's some parent guidance experts out here, Amina. I'll try and find one for a future episode. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aftab. It was such a pleasure to have you. I hope you enjoyed the, the conversation. Um, and I hope Yeah, great. Thank you so much for your invitation. And it was great sharing all my thoughts on my book and my thoughts regarding the students yeah wonderful. and the future right yeah so it's called the innovation shift in higher education if people want to, to kind of google and, and look it up it's uh, and it's published by spring and nature so it's easy to find um and i'll probably maybe i'll take a few uh, quotes from the book and, and, and put them on the website as well so people can get inspired to to dig deeper into the book and and look at some of the suggestions the recommendations some of the findings that 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 you've done in that in that piece of work thank you so Another, much. thank you so much for joining us i didn't actually at the beginning ask you uh, what you were drinking uh, i've got um well people are going to think i'm sick if i tell them the flavor of my tea this evening because it's lemon uh hibiscus and rose hips very healthy um, how about yourself Dr. Aftab? did you have tea oh, i had a cappuccino just before the meeting Yay, nice cappuccino cappuccino is more of a morning drink for me and a tea later in the day and coffee in the morning thank you so much um and it was such a pleasure to, to talk to you thank you everyone for joining us we are joined next week uh on the same day thursday the 9th uh by anna hasper and we're going to be celebrating international women's day together um, and having a talk about um, the importance of education for women and girls, and also sharing some of um, the females in education who have inspired us. We're going to be talking about female role models. Uh, Dr. Aftab, I guess you can be one of mine today, um, because yeah. you, you've inspired me by uh, sharing with me today, and also through the book when I when I went through it. That definitely inspires me. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll let you say goodbye and then I will finish up the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a take great day. Everybody. Yes, you take care, everybody. See you soon.